and it is time. It is 8 a.m. on Wednesday in the Philippines, 7 p.m. Tuesday evening in Central America. Welcome once again, this time to our Tuesday night Bible study. And let me uh, get some other notes up here and uh, I'll make some additional announcements. And let me open up where we will begin our study this evening. Um, we do have, uh, as you're aware, um, Dr. Jim is back on uh, teaching on Wednesday evenings. And he had his first Wednesday night class this past Wednesday, a week ago. And um, as a result, I have moved back to Tuesday night, as you learned in my messages that I've sent out. And so I'll continue to do that and get rid of this annotations screen up here. And we will, uh, there we go. Um, we'll begin, we'll continue our study in the book of Galatians. We've been studying in Galatians for uh, several weeks and we're now in Galatians chapter two and we'll continue our, our class there. And so I will be uh, teaching uh, on Tuesday night, uh, Wednesday morning here in the Philippines. For those of you who have joined us in uh, this side of the globe and uh, we'll continue our studies. Dr. Battelle on Wednesday, Thursday morning, Philippine time, and I'll teach on Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning, Philippine time. So with that, um, let me uh, begin with a word of prayer and we'll get started. We'll pick up our study where we left off. Uh, I trust you have made your own way with the Lord, confess sin as necessary, and is prepared uh, to hear the teaching and to allow the Holy Spirit to teach you the truths of what we study this evening. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to uh, continue sharing your word around the world. We have the modern technology today that we can broadcast live on Facebook, and, uh, Zoom, and so can record these and post them later on YouTube. So Father, I just pray that as people uh, learn about this opportunity to study and join us, that they will come in with a desire to learn the truth. That's the issue. And yes, we must be clean before the Lord through confession of sin, but we must have a desire to feast on the pure milk of your word. So Father, we thank you for again, giving us this opportunity to feast on your word. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for your glory, Father. Amen. Okay, um, the printout that I passed out two weeks ago uh, when we were studying, we were in uh, Galatians chapter two then, and we'd gotten as far, the, the notes only were printed up to Galatians 2.13. But when we finished that, Got to two thirteen. Got to two thirteen. We still had a few minutes left in in the in the uh, seventy five minutes. So I went ahead and and taught uh, verse two thirteen. Even though you didn't have the notes, the notes ended at two twelve. And so um, I've included the notes on the two thirteen in this print. Although I've already taught it, I did that two weeks ago. So we're going to pick up our study. Uh, today, this evening, as the case may be, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. And there we read, as Paul wrote, Okay, as Paul wrote in, in Galatians 2, 14, but what I saw, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Now, a little history here. What had happened? 
Paul was Paul had been teaching in Galatians. He was in Galatia, teaching the Galatians, and Peter decided to visit. And and Peter was fine. Peter was there, and as he was associating with the Gentiles and the Jews in that area in Galatia, and he was eating his meals with the Gentiles and so on and so forth, which was fine. But then when some people came from Jerusalem, from the church in Jerusalem, the people of James, it was it was said in Galatians, when they came, Peter reverted back. He didn't want to didn't want to upset his Jewish friends. And so he reverted back to behaving like a Jew instead of the grace that Paul was teaching. Peter reverted back to the law. And so that's what this verse is starting with. And Paul is saying, when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So let's pick this verse apart. It begins with, but when I saw. When Paul realized that Peter and the crowd that followed him defected from the gospel, he took decisive action. Since no one but him kept his eyes open to the grace principle, he did something about it. He goes on that they were not straightforward. When he saw, when I saw, he says, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. The word straightforward means to walk in a straight course. The word is orthopateo, comes from two words, orthos, meaning straight, and pos, meaning foot. Metaphorically, it means to act uprightly. Here, the idea is to walk in a straight path in the truth of grace. Many churches today do not take stands. They were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. As I said, the word straightforward is the word orthopedio, comes from two words, ortho straight and poos foot. Metaphorically, it means to act uprightly. Here, the idea is to walk in a straight path in the truth of grace. Paul goes on. Paul rebuked Peter publicly before the whole church. When he said, I said to Cephas. Let me get, let me get my something adjusted here just bear with me a moment all public injury deserves public rebuke they had they had little backbone in that church as paul writes in first timothy 5 20 those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning Public sin requires public rebuke. Paul rebuked Peter publicly before the whole church. This must have stung Peter's pride. Peter did not walk in conformity to gospel truth. Paul took the situation seriously. Many churches today do not take stands for truth. They have little biblical backbone. Public injury deserves public rebuke, as I just read in 1 Timothy 5.20. Public sin requires public rebuke. Paul's rebuke of Peter was not personal. Paul had no desire to humiliate Peter publicly. He didn't have that desire, but the truth had to be spoken. The overwhelming issue of, to Paul was the integrity of the gospel of grace. He was teaching grace as opposed to law. Therefore, 
Paul confronted Peter face to face. He goes on in verse 14. If you, he says, speaking to Peter, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews. Paul says that Peter is a Jew. This is his current condition under the appearance of legalism. Peter lived as a Jew before he came to Antioch. Peter's life among the Gentiles gave the appearance that he believed and lived the grace principle. If Peter had accepted grace gospel, the grace gospel, how could he go back to legalism? It's impossible to have both. You can't live by law and grace at the same time. If he was right under grace, then he was wrong to go back to the law. If we live by grace, we are not to follow the law. If we live by the law, we are not following grace. I remember a time I was in a church over here one time years ago. And in the back of the church, it was a, it was a Southern Baptist church. And in the back of the church hung the tithers rack. And it was interesting. There were two, four, six rows on the tithers rack. The top two rows had green labels. The middle two rows had yellow labels. And the bottom two rows, rows had red labels. And I looked back at that and I commented, I says, I see by the green labels, those must be the best tithers that you have. Now the ones whose names are in the yellow, they must be, uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. The bottom row red, they must not tithe at all. I'm sure wouldn't I wouldn't want my, want my name my name down there along with the red ones. But then I said, wait a minute. Tithing racks represent law, but you call the name of your church Grace Bible Church. You have a problem. You either need to remove the tithers rack or paint over the word grace because you can't have both. We cannot live under both law and grace at the same time. Paul goes on. How is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Peter compelled Gentiles to live as Jews. The word angazo compels, is the word compels or denotes, put constraint upon or compels. He forced Gentiles into Jewish theology. Peter's capitulation to the legalists tore apart the church at Antioch. Peter was especially blameworthy because of his station as an apostle. A leader's error always causes more consternation than anyone else's. When the leader falls, it shakes everyone up. Here's a principle. Our walk, the way we live, must be consistent with what we say or how we talk. How do we apply this principle? We can deny what we believe, not only by what we affirm, but how we act. Our talk can be right, but our walk can be wrong. When we live legalistically, we deny God the glory of his grace and we deny believers their liberty in christ moving on to verse 15 paul goes on we are now we are jews by nature and not sinners from among the gentiles the remainder of this chapter chapter 2 expands the idea of peter's inconsistency in reverting to legalism that goes from chapter 2, beginning now in verse 15, through to verse 21. We are not, he goes on, we are Jews by nature. Paul includes himself in the word we. Paul uses we four times in verses 15, 16, and 17. Paul and Peter were born Jews. That is their condition by nature, the Jews tended to hold themselves above Gentiles 
in self-righteous arrogance. By nature, does not mean that Jews were free from sinning. It just means that they are God's chosen people. God's people by covenant. So we are not, Paul says to Peter, we are Jews by nature and not sinners among the Gentiles. The Jews viewed Gentiles as sinners. The implication is that their religion was superior to that of the Gentiles as if religion somehow gained God's approbation. The Jews received the Old Testament by revelation. They were God's chosen people. They inferred from this that they were somehow superior morally to the Gentiles because God gave them the law. By siding with the Jews, Peter inferred that religion and not grace is the principle of salvation and of the Christian life. But the law is not the way of salvation. Even in the Old Testament, living by the law didn't save anybody. Salvation in the, in the Old Testament was again by faith alone in the promised Messiah. And when someone had the faith in the promised Messiah, they were born again, they were saved. Not by works, but by faith alone in the promised Messiah. To us in the New Testament, to us since Paul, during the time that Jesus was on the, on, the, on the earth, it was faith that he was, in fact, the Messiah. That's what saved them during the time of, of the gospel period, when they believed that this man, Jesus, whom they crucified, was, in fact, the Messiah they were saved. Now, once he was crucified, buried, and rose again, and since the Apostle Paul came on the scene with grace, now salvation is faith alone in Christ alone and what he did for us in the payment for our sins. And Paul will develop more of this idea in the next chapter. Our principle here is this. Christians stand in Christ's perfect righteousness before God eternally. To apply this principle, the gap between God and people is one of infinite degree. When people go to heaven, they go there on God's terms, not their own. Only Jesus could bridge the gap between the absolute and perfect righteousness of God and the relative righteousness of humankind. People cannot keep the law by human means, as Paul writes in Romans 3.20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And then in Romans 3.28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And Romans 6.14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, our next verse coming up. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. And then we'll see these verses later. As we get into Galatians chapter 2, they're coming up. Galatians 2, verses 19 to 21. For through the law, I died to the law, Paul writes, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if the righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Galatians 3, we're coming up to all of these verses in Galatians, and we'll study each verse word by word, phrase by phrase. Galatians 3, 2, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Paul writes, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And then in verse 5, 
So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit work miracles among and works miracles among you? Do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. And verse 10, for as many as are the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart law, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. We've just looked at the verses in Galatians and we're studying the book of Galatians. And these verses that we've just looked at, we'll, we'll go through each verse line by line, word by word, phrase by phrase. But you can see by these verses we just quoted why Galatians is considered to be the Paul's writing regarding dispensationalism versus grace. Law versus grace. A dispensational teaching of what changed under the Apostle Paul when Christianity began. Law versus grace. And then in Philippians, Philippians 3, 9, he writes, and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, found in him, that is, found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So looking at these passages, as a result of the point, people cannot keep the law by human means. The law is too perfect and too huge. Jesus fulfilled the law in every respect. When we believe in his death on the cross to forgive our sins, we fulfill the law as well. Romans 8, verses 2 to 4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This, is, uh, this verse reminds me, one of the errors we have, and there are many, many, many things in many different Bibles that are, are not in agreement. And this brings to mind one of the errors in the King James Bible, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The King James Bible adds that condition of walking not by the flesh, but walking by the spirit, that is a conditional clause in Romans 8, 1 in the King James Bible, making it conditional as to being not condemned. And that is an error. Romans 8, 1 in the NAS and NIV and other Bibles are correctly when they say, there is now therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, end, stop, finish. The phrase that the Catholics added to the King James Bible in Romans 8, 1 is actually the last part of verse 4, as we read here in Romans 8, 2 to 4. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So somewhere along the line, that phrase who walk not after the flesh, but after this, but according to the spirit, got added to Romans 8, 1 in the King James Bible. Moving on with our points. Christ abrogated our responsibility to live by the law because he fulfilled it. When we believe in his death on the cross to forgive our sin. We fulfill the law as well. Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law 
for righteousness to everyone who believes. There is no salvation outside Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross. Verse 16. Nevertheless, Paul goes on, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. In this verse, we have an affirmation and a denial. We have an affirmation of how God declares a person justified. He justifies him by faith in Christ's death to forgive sin. We also have a denial. God does not justify a person by works of the law. Paul is in the process of reproving Peter for his reversion into legalism. Upon the arrival of legalists from Jerusalem, as you recall, the situation projected Peter into a predicament. He left fellowship with Gentiles and relapsed back into legalism. He tried to accommodate both law and grace at the same time, and that never works. Paul goes on in the verse, nevertheless, he goes on. That's the tense of the word knowing. The word is oida. Knowing in the perfect tense shows that Paul and Peter knew by experience that the law cannot justify a sinner or sanctify a saint in the past and that they continued to know it, continued. Perfect tense, oida. Peter failed to apply what he knew about the principle of grace. Paul appeals to common knowledge about the principle of grace. And the principle, Christians and non-Christians must grasp the principle of grace very carefully, or very clearly, I should say, very clearly. The application to this principle, do not have, or do you have, a clear understanding of justification by grace alone and faith alone. No matter how religious, or well-behaved, gracious, philanthropic, cultured, or well-educated we might be, if we do not accept the fact that only death, faith in the death of Jesus Christ forgives sin, God will not justify us. We may have good standing with people, but we have no standing with God. A good standing in our community will not impress God when we meet him in heaven. That will get us a big funeral, but not eternal life. So, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified, or justified is dikayu, primarily sets forth the idea to deem or to declare or to cause to be right. The standard for relating to God is God himself. God cannot compromise in his integrity. As an absolute being, he cannot do anything outside his character, nor can he live with anyone that is outside his character. Every person on earth, save one, has committed sin. We all fall short of who God is in his righteousness. As Paul writes in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And then in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul uses the word justified four times in verses 16 and 17. When we stand in God's court, our lawyer must defend us according to the laws of God. The laws that govern God himself. The word justified connotes the idea of receiving justification. It's in the passive voice. 
God justifies us. We can't justify ourselves. We are justified. He justifies us. Christ, faith in Christ is the means by which we are justified. Justification is something that God does, not people. We do not earn or deserve justification. Man is not justified by law, by the works of the law. God declares people who believe Jesus died for their sins as right as he himself is right, exclusively by faith, not by works. God renders them as right as himself the moment they place faith in Christ's death as payment for their sins. God henceforth treats them as judicially right in his eyes. They are right because God resolved his justice at the cross. So we're not justified, not by the works of the law, but we are justified through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul uses a similar phrase later in this verse. Faith is the instrument of salvation. There is no inherent merit in faith. The merit is in the object of faith. And then he goes on in verse 16. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus. Even or since. Even is, is could be meaning since we have believed in Christ Jesus. Believe means to be persuaded of. And hence, to place confidence in. When we believe in Christ, we place confidence in or give credit to Jesus as the only one who can save us from our sins. We entrust our entire eternal future on Christ Jesus. He is worthy of our trust. So even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified. The word justified is a causative verb in the Greek. When we trust the death of Christ to forgive our sins, the causative trusting, because we have trusted in that cause, the, the death of Christ to forgive our sins, God declares us to be right, as right as he is right forever. Justification is more, more than a declaration of not guilty. It is a declaration of being as right as God is right. So that we may be justified by faith in Christ. When we place our trust in Christ, we come to the place of full persuasion that we can trust him for our eternal future. We rely on his character, not ours. Faith in Christ as our object makes our faith valid. Remember, faith requires an object. And when the object our faith, the object of our faith is Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, salvation is the result. Faith in Christ as our object makes our faith valid. There is no validity in faith itself. The validity of faith depends totally on the object. Jesus is completely believable because of his person and his work. That's why when Jesus is the object of our faith, we are saved for all eternity. We're saved by that faith in Christ not by works of the law. Even noble keeping of the law cannot make a person measure up to God's standard because every person has fallen short of God's righteousness. As Paul writes in Romans 3, 19 through 24, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. 
because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 28, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. No quantity of keeping the law can bring a person to the point of justification. Three times, Paul declares that God justifies people by faith. And three times he affirms that God does not justify a person by the works of the law. The principle we take from this, God's own standard of absolute righteousness is the standard for us going to heaven. To apply that principle, any claim that God causes a person to be right as he is right by works profanes God's character. Some people think that if they keep the Ten Commandments, they're on good footing with God. The purpose of the law is not to justify us. The purpose of the law is to show us our need for justification. We're going to see that as we get into Galatians chapter 3. God never justified an Old Testament person by offering an animal sacrifice. God justifies no one by keeping the laws of the Old Testament. The law teaches us about the knowledge of sin and how it separates us from God. We cannot go to a dying person and say, now you have to be, you have to do more good works than bad to go to heaven. You have to keep the Ten Commandments, keep the golden rule. There will be no hope for that person. I do not have to have time to keep the golden rule would be the response. I only have a few hours of life left. I, I, I saw something. Oh, I think. Oh, I forget now. It was a video I saw on YouTube not too long ago. And it was, it was someone, someone questioning uh, someone in, uh, I think it was Jehovah's Witness. They were questioning a Jehovah's Witness. And the person questioning the men said, well, please tell me uh, if I were if I were to uh, come to to your church, to Jehovah's Witness Church, uh, I'm a I'm a sinner. And and I have I have cancer. And could you give me a, a message of salvation? What would you tell me? Please, what would you tell me? As Jehovah's Witness, I'm dying. I have cancer. I want to be saved. What can you tell me? And the, and the Jehovah's Witness finally turned away and walked away because there was nothing, nothing that she could tell him by which he could be saved. This comment here, this thing, we cannot, we cannot go to a dying person and say, well, now... Before you die, you have to do more good works than bad to go to heaven. You have to keep the Ten Commandments. You have to keep the golden rule. Of course, we know the comment our dying person might respond, I don't have time to keep the golden rule. I only have a few hours of life left. The good news that we have for someone in that condition is that Jesus will save poor lost sinners. Faith in Christ alone for what he did on the cross will save anyone who will believe that gospel truth. The only way God accepts us is through undiluted grace. Salvation is free of charge. 
God who is undiminished righteousness would declare a person who embraces the cross for forgiveness to be as righteous as he, God, is righteous. This is not something humans can manufacture. As Paul reminds us in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. And again, as we just read in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The split second, we place our faith in the finished work of the Son of God on the cross. God causes us to be right in his eyes. The split second, God declares us to be more than innocent. He declares us acquitted, more than innocent, more than acquitted, more than pardoned. Let me say that again. God declares us to be more than innocent, more than acquitted, more than pardoned. God declares us to be as right as he is right. And only God can do that. Verse 17. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. But if while seeking to be justified in Christ, Paul goes on, Paul's antagonist contended that justification by faith eradicates the moral law. If grace does away with law, then people can live as they please. They argue that eliminating the law would mean that a person could do as he or she pleases. That exactly is the argument So, uh, from so many legalistic churches, legalistic denominations. Even those denominations that will say, yes, we're, we're saved by grace through faith alone. And then turn right around and tell you that you have to tithe or that you can't come to church. Ladies can't come to church in blue jeans or whatever else law they want to add in there. All the antagonists contended that justification by faith eradicates the moral law. If grace does away with law, then people can live as they please. That's their argument. They argue that eliminating the law would mean that a person could do as he or she pleases. Peter and his crowd argued by implication that a person has to work for justification. The cross of Christ is not enough for salvation, was their argument. We ourselves have also been found sinners, Paul goes on in verse 17. While seeking to be justified by, but if, the verse reads, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners. It was an admission on the part of Jewish Christians that justification by works proves that they are sinners. Their failure in keeping the law forces them to admit their sin condition. They did not find righteousness in keeping the law. Basically, they realizing that even keeping the law did not wipe away the fact that they were sinners. So then they asked the question, if this is the case, if we can bypass the law, then we can do whatever we want. And their question was, is Christ then a minister of sin? If God declares a person right in his eyes by faith, does this mean Christians are lawless? Does this make Christians lawless? Legalists argue in this way. Quote, if Christ does away with the law for salvation and sanctification, then that would make Christ lawless. Christ would endorse sin would be their conclusion. This conclusion is false because Christ dealt with the sin issue on the cross. To believe that God justifies and sanctifies a person by faith does not imply lawlessness. 
Liberty is not liberty from God's righteous standards. Neither is it lawlessness to fellowship with Gentiles. Going back to the law as a system of salvation and sanctification abandons the grace principle. We imply that Christ did on the, what Christ did on the cross was not sufficient. And that's 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 my question to so many people that think you have to live a good life in addition to faith in Christ. By saying that, what they're really saying is what Christ did on the cross was not sufficient. We have to add something to what Christ did. If he is right, if Peter is right in going back to the Mosaic law, then he was wrong in eating with the Gentiles. If he was right in eating with the Gentiles, then he was wrong in going back to the Mosaic law. If he is right in one place, he is wrong in the other. He cannot hold the two at the same time. They are mutually exclusive. If the start, if it starts out by grace, if he starts out by grace, then goes back to the law, he then abandons grace. He would say, in effect, that what Christ did on the cross was not enough. Peter's return to legalism was an attack on grace. And Paul says, may it never be. May it never be. When a question is asked, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. The conclusion that Christ is the minister of sin is the right inference if Peter's reversion to legalism is right. The thought that Christ is the minister of sin is a revolting thought to Paul. The law cannot add anything to the death of Christ for our sins. Let me read that conclusion again. The conclusion that Christ is the minister of sin is the right inference if Peter's reversion to legalism is right. If Peter's reversion to legalism, legalism is right, then the conclusion that Christ is a minister of sin is right. But the thought of Christ as the minister of sin is a revolting thought to Paul, and it should be a revolting thought to us. The law cannot add anything to the death of Christ for our sins. If we carefully investigate the justification in Christ and find ourselves to still be sinners, that does not make Christ the minister of sin. This is an abhorrent thought. Paul adamantly denied the accusation that Christ promotes sin by offering the principle of grace. The principle of grace does not endorse licentiousness. Let's apply this principle. The principle of grace never encourages sinful living. People who believe in Christ no longer do as they please because they are under the lordship of Christ. I've heard someone say, it's, it doesn't give me a license to sin. It frees me from, from realizing that I don't have to sin. I don't have to sin. We're free from sin if we want to be. People who believe in Christ no longer do as they please because they are under the lordship of Christ. When Christians abandon grace and revert to legalism as a way to gain God's approbation, then they vilify Christ's work on the cross. They imply that his work is not sufficient for salvation or sanctification. They say, in effect, that after they accept Christ as Savior, they are still not sure of salvation. Christ's finished work on the cross flies in the face of all of that. He is sufficient for salvation and sanctification. Doesn't Christ's death on the cross, grace does not give us a license to sin. Grace assures me that I don't have to sin if I don't want to. Galatians 2.18 for if I rebuild what I had once destroyed, Paul says, 
I prove myself to be a transgressor. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, Paul destroyed legalism when he put his trust in the cross as the way of salvation. Hypothetically, if Paul tore down the house of legalism as a way of salvation and sanctification, then rebuilding it would be inconsistent with grace. Self-righteousness would replace Christ's provided righteousness. The word kataluo, destroyed, means to completely demolish, to level to the ground. Paul completely destroyed the law as a system of salvation and sanctification. Paul was in the business of destroying false doctrine. He will show in chapters three and four that the law never did save or sanctify. Biblical consistency is a core value of Christianity. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, he says, he goes on, I prove myself to be a transgressor. The word for transgressor is parabatis. It means someone who crosses over a line or a standard. Paul would violate the standard of grace if he reverted to law. Paul, in that case, constitutes or establishes himself as a transgressor. Righteousness based on merit will show how extensively we violate the law. Righteousness based on merit will show how extensively we violate the law. Principle here, law and grace are mutually exclusive. They cannot be coextended for one contradicts the other. Grace plus law equals nothing. Grace plus law equals nothing. Application. When we believe in the spiritual death of Jesus Christ to forgive our sins, we in effect destroy the law as a system of salvation. If we revert to the law, we rebuild as a system of salvation. If we choose both the law and grace as systems of salvation, we restrict both of them. A foundational truth of Christianity is that we are sinful in comparison to a holy God. We have a heart of mutiny against God. The only cure for that rebellion is the cross. We cannot engender righteousness from within because we are corrupt within. This only points to our desperate need for Christ and his work on the cross. It is not the doctor's fault when we have heart disease. Our clogged arteries are killing us. Doctors merely report test results. They simply tell us the truth of our mistakes and what how we've cared for ourselves. Christianity tells us the truth about how God views us as totally depraved. Not totally depraved to man, but totally depraved to a holy God. It does me no good to keep patching my house if the structure is fundamentally flawed. Boy, that, that reminds me of our house here in the Philippines. We've built it there in 2008, 2009, and all the wood in it, our termites have found their way. And I believe that probably next year, we're probably gonna have to have, to have it rebuilt because uh, termites are tearing down the walls, no sense putting up wood over it. We gotta get rid of the termites. It does me no good to keep patching my house if the structure is fundamentally flawed. 
I have a primary problem in my spiritual house that no patchwork will fix. It has to do with the foundation of my being. That's our problem. God condemned our moral house. That is why we tear down any attempt at self-righteousness as a way of gaining God's approval. We must acknowledge that the only approval we can have before him is our acceptance in Christ. It is a shameful thing to face the fact that we have nothing to offer God. In humility, we must throw ourselves on the work of Christ for salvation and for sanctification. Verse 19. He goes on. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. For through the law, I. Paul uses himself as an illustration again. He contrasts himself who operates in grace to Peter who rever reverted to legalism. The law shows the standard for entering heaven, perfection. The standard for going to heaven is God's righteousness. None of us is that righteous. So we need Christ to deal with our sin. As Paul wrote in 320 of Romans. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And then in Romans 10, 4. For the end, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul died to the law through the law. The law itself put him to death. The law asks no more than death. Once the law puts the condemned to death, he or she is free from the law. The person is legally dead. God's legal system closes the case. We died to the law through Christ's death. It was the law that demanded Christ's death for our sin. Because God cannot tolerate sin of any kind. As we will read and study in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. For it is written. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The principle. The Christian is legally free. From the law through Christ's death. On the cross. Applying the principle, Jesus took the eternal death we richly deserved. Jesus took that death I deserved on the cross. God paid the legal penalty through Christ's death on the cross. Our death in Christ freed us from the penalty that the law demanded. The law convicts every person as a transgressor of God's righteousness. Christians stand dead to the law in God's eyes, as we'll see in verse 20. The law lost its claim on us at the cross. It is only then that we begin to live to God. As soon as Christians put themselves under the law, they are dead to God. The law condemns us to death and kills us. The law was not dead to us but us to the law. The best thing that the law did to us was kill us. Until we come to Christ, the law puts us to death. The standards of the law killed Christ. There was no way we could have a proper standing in God's eyes until God settled the sin issue by Christ's death. Some of us suspect that we can keep some sizable, sizable percentage of the law. This is because we are unaware of what is involved in keeping the law. We must keep the law 100%, not 92, not 32. That's what legalists, legalists like to do that. They like to have a list. Give me a list. Give me a list of, of 20 things I should and should not do. And let me check them off. 
you know, your pa uh, passing score is 70% now in most schools. 70%, you'll get a C, you'll pass on to the next next grade. But typically that doesn't work. Some of us suspect that we can keep some citable percentage of the law. This is because we are unaware of what is involved in keeping the law. We must keep the law 100% to be acceptable to God. As James writes in 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Because we cannot keep the standard of the law, it becomes a sledgehammer against us. We think that the law saves us, but it only condemns us. Only trust in Christ's death on the cross can save us. He goes on in verse 19. Died to the law. God condemned us from the curse of the law, having become a curse, for it is written. We died. He died to the law. Not only are we dead through the law. But we are also dead to the law. We legally die to the law when we embrace the cross to obtain forgiveness for our sins. The law has no claim beyond death. Jesus paid our debt to the law by his death. He substituted his death for our death. The law demands a penalty. For those who break it, through the law, Paul died to the law. The law killed any hope of his living for God. Paul's status of having been crucified with Christ, as we'll study in verse 20, freed him from sin and its consequences. We'll read in Galatians 3.13 when we get there. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, as we just read above. I will be a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The law curses us, but Christ killed the judgment of the law. The law has no further claim on the Christian. The law itself kills any hope of merit before God. It precludes any hope of justification or sanctification by works because it places the standard too high for any sinner to achieve. However, the law has no authority over people executed for crimes. They have paid their penalty by death. Society has no further claim on them. Paul writes in Romans 6 verses 1 to 14, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do we not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have, if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. But reckon yourselves, consider yourselves to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as the instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves, yield to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, 
but under grace. And then in Romans 7, verses 1 to 4, Paul says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has just has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she said she is joined to another man. Boy, that verse is powerful. If we if we believe in grace and want to go back to law, it's like us being an adulteress to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse four, therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another to him. Jesus Christ, who was raised from the dead, in order that we might fear, bear fruit for God. Faith in Christ, we are we are joined to him. And when we slip back into the law, it's as though the person married to one person has an affair with another person. That's adultery. And when we who are married to Christ through grace choose to live by law, it's like we're committing adultery. Jesus died for our sin. So the penalty of the law was, has no further claim on us. Paul does not say that the law is dead. Far from it. He says that he is dead to the law. We are dead to the law. In the eyes of the law, he says, I do not exist anymore. In the eyes of the law, we do not exist anymore. The law has no authority over me. He says, even though it is very much alive. It still curses and condemns the sinner. The law still demands the death of the transgressor. But we are no longer transgressors because Christ forgave us when we came to trust his work on the cross. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Paul does not claim that he is a lawless person. He is no law unto himself. His point is that law has no claim on him. The law declared him a sinner and punished him for his sin through Christ. Now he is free from the law because Christ fulfilled the law. Another principle. The law has no authority over the Christian because Christ fulfilled the demands of the law by his death on, death on the cross. To apply the principle, the law has no more authority over us now that we have died to it by Christ's death. When a woman's husband dies, her legal relationship to her husband dissolves. When Christ died for our sins, we died to the law. The law no longer condemns us. Romans 7, 4 to 6, Paul writes, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. So that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve no newness of the spirit. We serve in newness of the spirit and not in bold oldness of the letter. Galatians 6.14. But may it, never, may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds, you were healed. We do not try to die. We are dead already. We cannot crucify ourselves. We have been crucified with Christ already. When Jesus died on the cross, I died there on that cross. 
as we'll see in verse 20. This is the way God looks at us if we have been born again. Reading in Colossians 2.20 and 21. Paul writes in Colossians, if, if you have died with Christ in the elementary principles of the world, why? As if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. According to Paul, we have died to the law. The law brings us to a realization of sin, Romans 3.20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The law makes us give up all hope in self and human merit. It drives us to place our hope in Christ alone. The Christian is like a corpse at which the law can thunder with all its might but get no response. The law does not get the stir of a, of a finger or a flicker of an eyelash. No master can give orders to a dead slave. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Therefore, let, us be no, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. And Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Stop. The law has no remedy for sin. It has a double power fact. The law declares us sinners. The law states our penalty for being sinners. Suppose a person committed the terrible crime of murder. He deserves the death penalty or life in prison. The authorities arrest him, bring him before a judge, and arraign him for murder. They call the witnesses one by one. They all testify with one accord to the man's guilt. There seems to be no defense for him at all. The jury finds him guilty. He is guilty according to the law and the authorities should put him to death. Before the judge pronounces the sentence, something suddenly happens to the accused. While he is on the stand, the man suddenly slumps down and dies. A physician pronounces him officially and legally dead. What does the judge do now? Does he continue with the penalty? He cannot carry out any penalty. The law cannot try, convict, nor carry out a penalty on a dead man. He is beyond the reach of the law. All that the judge can do is wrap his gavel and solemnly dismiss the case and adjourn the court. The man is dead in the eyes of the law. Uh, in the case of this illustration, the man cheated the law. The law had the right to put him to death, but could not do so because he was already dead. Well, in our case, Christ fulfilled all the requirements of the law. Romans 8, 2 to 4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was, through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul goes on in 19, so that I might live to God. The law did not Paul uh, permit Paul to live a life of unqualified devotion to God because the law could not satisfy the absolute requirements of God as a means of salvation and sanctification. Romans 7, 4 to 6. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who we raised, was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sin, sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not 
and oldest of the letter. The believer's union with Christ is with his death and resurrection. The law cannot bring life because no one ever lived up to the law except Jesus Christ. The law prohibited Paul from living to God. When Paul died to the law through the death of Christ, law lost all its claims on him. You cannot arrest a dead man for loitering in the cemetery. Now we can live to God because we have life, new life in Christ. He has given us a new resurrection life. Jesus did not put us to death to the law, but that might we live, that we might live for self. He put us to death to the law, to the law that we might live to God. Well, we're right in the middle of, of this verse 19. So I think what we'll do, it's time to, to end. And we've only got a few verses left. So we'll pick up here and finish verse 19, 20 and 21. Uh, next time we're together on next Tuesday. And um, with this, we'll, we'll close with a prayer. Uh, I had talked some time ago that if we wanted to try uh, some questions or answers, uh, I can extend the meeting longer, but I have received no response in that regard. So we'll just continue to plan a 75 minute study uh, each Tuesday evening. And so um, with that, let me close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for this time together that we've had in your word in the book of Galatians chapter two. Such a, such a powerful, powerful book regarding law and grace. And Father, if we can only understand that and live that in our own lives and be able to share that this massive truth regarding law versus grace. We have so many, so many people that we know out there who are trying to mix the two and we can't, it cannot be done. So thank you, Father, for our lesson tonight. Thank you for all those who have joined and will join later as they observe the lesson on YouTube. We do this, Father, as we feed on your word for your honor and your glory. Thank you, Father, for all you provide in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week.